So good morning, everybody, and welcome to Suffrey Baptist Church. We do especially want to welcome you if you're a visitor. Uh, if it's your first time here, I can't see anyone here for the first time, but if it is you for your first time, a particular welcome to you. And a warm welcome to those who are going to be watching this service online. We hope and pray that though you're not here with us in the building, you'll still get a wonderful sense of God's presence and God's blessing and God speaking to you as you watch this. We're going to come to God in prayer. Let's bow our heads, shall we? Father, we thank you for this new day. The Bible says that God's mercies are new every morning. And Lord, we know that every morning when we wake up, we can come to you and find fresh grace. Or maybe we fail. Maybe we're feeling that we've let you down or let others down. But we thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can begin each day in you. We can be cleansed. We can be washed. We can be renewed. We can be recommissioned. So we want to pray, Lord Jesus, that as we come to worship, we might remember you're a God of grace and forgiveness, love and mercy. And we come to you, Lord Jesus. We want to lift up our eyes. We want to see you. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would move in our midst this morning and meet with us in some way. We worship you, King Jesus. Amen. Amen. My light, stand up as we come to worship God. Then we will start singing at uh, 10,000 reasons.
the breath of God. It breathes into us spiritual life. We thank you that just as we, when we were born, we cried. When we took that first breath, we cried. So when we come to know Jesus, the Spirit comes and dwells in us and we cry, Abba, Father. That is a spiritual cry. Lord, we worship you. Breath of God, Son of God, Father. Accept our praise for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Please sit down. Well, we do welcome you to Sudbury Baptist Church if you've just joined us. I hope and pray that you'll know something of God's presence and God's blessing upon you in the service this morning. Just a couple of uh, notices. Next Sunday will be our communion service, and so come prepared to share bread and wine together. If you are going to be watching the service online, uh, then if you next week you might want to get some bread and wine ready before the service. Uh, I've also been asked to pray for somebody else. Faye, would you like to come forward? That's right, it's Dawn structure in this, okay? You can, you, can, you can tell her off after the service. Hey, why has why has Dawn asked me to invite you up? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> she she knows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a special celebration last week, wasn't it? In Tuesday gone. Yeah, yeah. And what was that? My 80th birthday. Hey. <laughs> So Faye has now hit that great milestone of 80. Yeah, so. and I enjoy every moment. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. Tuesday, it was great. My yeah. son, they sent me away for a couple of days. Did they? Yeah, right. and I enjoyed it. Yeah. So with all your 80 years of wisdom, have you got anything you want to impart to the church? Just keep moving like what they do and keep praying. Right. And I don't know what else to say, but I feel great. I'm 80, so I'm going to pain. But last night I was up most of the night with pain. But I'm still here this morning. I didn't know who they really reach. I just look at the clock and I say, look at the time, I can't make it. But I do make it and I give God thanks for my son. That bring me down. Amen. And thank all my church brothers and church sisters. And just when you have the pain, like what I have, I have a lot of pain. But most time I don't show it. I just keep going. Right? Just keep going. It's hard. It's not easy. But just keep going and pray. And God will take you through. Remember, I'm going 21. <laughs> Father, we thank you for Faith, Lord. We thank you for just for knowing her, Lord. Uh, many of us have known Faith for many, many years. And we just know what an incredible blessing and an encouragement and an example she is to every single one of us. And we thank you for her, Lord. We thank you for this great milestone of 80 years and we do want to pray for her that you would bless her lord jesus that you would draw ever closer to her lord we want to pray that she might be uh, become even more like you lord jesus in everything she does and everything she says lord thank you for her testimony that though she's in pain she keeps going on we thank you for that endurance that perseverance that you give to her and we pray for her and we pray for her family, Lord. We ask your blessing upon them. And we pray for everyone that goes into her house, that they might feel warm and welcome. But most of all, they might sense something of the presence of Jesus. Lord, we thank you 
for her, and we commit her to you now, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 bow our heads for a moment in prayer shall we just before I say any prayers maybe uh, just in the quietness there are things that you want to bring to Jesus just take this opportunity to do that Lord, we come to you in prayer. Lord, prayer is such a wonderful gift and opportunity a privilege that you give to each one of us who know you. That we have access to the Father. We've been going through Hebrews in the evenings in the Bible studies and thinking about how that access to the Holy of Holies was restricted, that only the high priest could go in there and he could only go in once a year. But we, through Jesus, have permanent access to the throne of grace. And we can find mercy, we can find help in our times of need. Lord, we worship you. And we bring our needs, our requests, we bring our struggles, our problems, bring our anxieties, our fears. Lord, there's so much fear around at the moment, so much anxiety, so much uncertainty about the future. Lord, we bring all of that to you, Lord Jesus, knowing that you will be with us in the midst of all of those things. You you never leave us or forsake us. But we bring our government to you at this time. Lord, we so want our nation to be able to return to normal, to get on with life as much as possible as it was before. And we, we want to pray for the government. You give them wisdom to know the right way, the right time to do all of that. Because Lord, we also want to be here. We want to be able to praise you freely without inhibitions to worship you if your God is worthy of our praise. Lord Jesus, as we turn to your word now, we ask that you'd speak to us for Jesus. Amen. I've called my uh, sermon this morning um, Putting out the rubbish. Okay, that's the title. Hopefully, um, you will see why I'm talking about that in a moment. Last week, we talked about the super cleansing power of the gospel. We looked at the Apostle Paul, how he was stopped in his tracks on the Damascus Road how Jesus took hold of him and he was utterly changed. If you remember, he said that Jesus took hold of me, the worst of sinners, as an example to others. And Paul really believed that because of the way God had transformed his life, he could transform anybody's life. Didn't matter how bad you were, didn't matter what you'd done, Jesus could change you because he changed him and he realized that this newfound confidence and relationship with God that he had was all God's doing it wasn't anything he couldn't change himself you remember we had uh, some coins last week and I got people to try and polish the dirt off and they, they couldn't do it but then 
We just drop them in some salt and vinegar and that cleansed them. And I was saying that that's a bit like what Jesus does for us. We are, we can try and change ourselves. We can try and make ourselves holy. But only God can do that. Paul realised that his salvation was all by God's grace. That's that old hymn, isn't there? Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to your cross I cling. But not everybody in the church shared this same conviction that Paul did. There were some of his fellow Jewish people, fellow, fellow Jews, who became followers of Jesus, but they had a slightly different idea about what they meant. They felt that, yes, when you come to Jesus, your sins are forgiven, uh, and you then start a new life, but that in order to be a really good Christian, you have to keep on following the laws from the Old Testament. They didn't seem to realise that Jesus had started something that was radically new. And, you know, if we're honest, we often don't like change, do we? We like things to be the way they were before. We like things to be how they always were, perhaps how they were when we were young, and all this change that's going on. A number of times people have said to me, oh, I don't like all this change. I can't keep up with it. Well, a lot of uh, Paul's Jewish friends who've become believers in Jesus, they wanted to keep as much as possible of the old life the laws, the food laws, etc., etc. And what made it worse was that these people began to boast that because they kept the laws, and some of these other people didn't, that they were better. They began to think they were better than others. Who, who likes peacocks? Yeah. There's, there's somebody in this church who doesn't like peacocks. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story of what happened. Um, David, when he was about four or five, we, um, um, he went on a school trip to a farm. And I, I went with him as a sort of parent helper. And we went into this barn, very dark barn, and out of nowhere, this huge peacock um, panicked, started uh, ru rustling its feathers, and it jumped on David's head. So a little four-year-old, and he's standing there screaming his head off. And the more he's screaming, the more this peacock is flapping away. And uh, I was standing there laughing. No, I wasn't laughing. Um, but they're big, aren't they? And I thought, I've got to get this peacock off of his head. You know, they're quite scary, even for adults. Imagine, if you're a child, they're terrifying. So I had to run at this peacock and uh, scare it off. So David doesn't like peacocks. I kind of get that, the stuff of nightmares. But the thing about peacocks is they strut around, don't they, with their feathers open. And uh, apparently they're doing this sometimes to attract a mate. What they're doing is they're kind of walking around saying, look at me, baby. I'm, I'm the one you want. Look at me. You know, do you know some men like that? You know, strut around. Maybe you do. But uh, they look very proud. Don't they? Very imposing. I mean, I don't know whether they are proud. I mean, we don't know because they can't speak, but just looks that. And we talked about he was strutting around like a peacock. Well, these people in the church were strutting around saying, we are keeping the law. We are better than these other Christians, particularly those Gentiles, those non-Jews who don't have the law. And Paul saw that there was a danger to the church, that this had to be stopped. And so, 
he began to speak to them. And uh, the, the reading is Philippians 3, verses 1 to 16. I'm just going to read a first few verses of that out. We're going to go through step by step. He says, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write the same thing to you, and it's a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it's we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself might have reasons for such confidence. So he's, he's writing to these people. These people are saying, you need the law, you need circumcision, you need to keep all of the stuff that we've always kept. Once you've come to faith in Jesus, don't abandon all of that. And what does Paul say? Watch out for those dogs. He calls them dogs. Mind you, when he says dogs, we think of dogs in the UK, don't we? As cute things, uh, pets. But he's thinking more of kind of wolf-like dogs, predators on the lookout for someone or something to devour. He calls them dogs. It's not very polite, is it? It can be a bit rude. If I called you a dog, you might get a bit upset with me. But Paul did this because he realised there was a danger to the church. Once you start adding in rules and regulations, the gospel is in danger. It becomes, it changes from being believe in Jesus and you're saved to believe in Jesus and do this and do that and then you'll be saved. And then you begin to think that your salvation is something that you contribute to. That it's not all of God, but it's, it starts with God, but it's partly you that's saving yourself in a way. And Paul realised that that was to lose sight of the gospel. You know, when I was a, uh, a young teenager, probably about 13 or 14, I'd always loved cycling. Who likes cycling? Yeah. I don't do a lot around here. Um, I don't, with the traffic, it's not, not great, is it? Um, to be honest, now my ears are gone, my balance isn't great, I'm a bit wobbly. But I used to love it as a child. And I joined something called the Cyclist Touring Club. Uh, there was a local group of them, and uh, basically what you do, you meet up, and it was actually on a Sunday morning uh, when we used to meet. This was before I went to church. And uh, we'd meet up and we'd go for a cycle ride. You go to some, sometimes you go to a great monument. We went to the Quainton Steam Railway one time. You'd cycle somewhere, you'd have your lunch, then you'd cycle back. Well, I was speaking to people about this club and they said, oh yeah, well, you know, we normally do about 30 or 40 miles. So I thought, oh, well, I can do that. So my first trip out with the Cyclist Touring Club, and they said, today is a special day, we're going to be going a bit further. And I was like, how far are we going to be going? I said, well, it's been just over 100 miles. Like, 100 miles? What, one day? I'm joking. Anyway, so I went on this cycle ride, and seemed to go on forever, it took hours and hours. Anyway, we finally arrived at this place for lunch, and then had lunch, a bit of something, and then we got a cycle back. I couldn't believe it. I was only, I was only about 13 or 14, and uh, anyway, I remember one point cycling back, and, and because I grew up in Chesham, it's all hilly around there, the Chilton Hills, and there was this hill that seemed to have no end. And I was absolutely exhausted, thinking, why have I ever thought of joining the Cyclist Touring Club? What am I doing here? I could be relaxing at home. And, and I was really flagging. I was getting slower and slower and slower. I didn't think I was going to make it. And then this super fit guy, OK, 
came cycled down the hill, he'd already been up the hill, he saw me flying, he cycled down the hill and he put his arm on my back and he said, I'll get you up there. And, whoosh, and suddenly I'm going really fast. This is great, this is fantastic. He said, yeah, sometimes you need a bit of help, don't you? And I'm thinking, yeah, I would never have made this. And he got me to the top of the hill. I couldn't have made it on my own. And that's kind of Paul's experience of Jesus, wasn't it? He was trying to make himself holy. He was trying to be the person that God wanted him to be. And on, on the outside, he kind of looked quite good. But he knew that inside, it was all a bit of a sham. He couldn't really change himself. And Jesus had come along and said, I will get you there. I will get you to heaven. I can do it. It's my grace. Now imagine if I'd gone on the next cyclist touring club uh, meeting, and I did actually. I actually I kept going. I went for quite a few years with this club, and they're sitting in. I'm sitting in the club room, and the guy that's given me the help isn't there. And they say, Graham, how did you get on on your first run? Oh yeah, that was great. How, how did you cope with that hill? Oh yeah, fine, nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could do that. Yeah, 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 it's a bit tough, but sort of stuck, got going, dug in. And it would be nonsense. It would be boasting. It wouldn't be true. And these people were getting into a bit of boasting. They were boasting about the stuff they were doing, the extra stuff that was making them extra holy. They were looking down on others who weren't doing the same things that they were doing. And Paul was having none of this. He said, no, no, no. That's right. And he does something which uh, seems a little bit strange at first, but he's, he decides to play them at their own game. <laughs> decides to play them at their own game. And he says this. If someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. Paul said, do you know what? You're boasting. I can boast more than you you want to do it like that. I belong, I'm a Jew, I followed the law, I was circumcised. I am a member of the tribe of Benjamin. And if you know anything about the tribe of Benjamin from the Old Testament, they were the people that had been faithful to David when all the other tribes abandoned them. He says, I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. What he's probably saying is, look, I don't have any mixed heritage. I am a pure Jew. And that was very important for the Jews, their ancestry. Um, you know, I, um, I was intrigued. Um, about my ancestry and I sent off a DNA sample to ancestry.co.uk. Has anybody else done this DNA test? Uh, just me, is it? Okay, that, that makes me look odd. Anyway, um, so, quiet, okay. Um, and I found out, much to my surprise, that um, I was is it 29% Irish? Now, that really surprised me. I knew my dad had a few cousins uh, in Ireland at some time, but 29% Irish, 8% German. Well, that, that was kind of interesting as well, but it was the Irish. 29% Irish. It seems that I have ancestors in Tipperary. 
You know, there's a song, isn't there? It's a long way to Tipperary. This was written by a labourer who was living in London, thinking about his homeland back in uh, Tipperary. So I, um, I did it on Google Maps. How far is it to, uh, Tipper, to Tipperary? There we go. You can get there. I think it said, what was it? In nine hours, 22 minutes, we go across on the ferry. Um, so, ancestry. Um, interesting thing, another interesting thing. If you remember, Barack Obama also has some Irish ancestry. And he went over to um, a place called Moneygall. He said, I've come over to Ireland to find my missing apostrophe. Um, and there's a, there's a great song that was written to commemorate his visit. Um, and the, 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 the chorus said, there's no one as Irish as Barack Obama. Okay? Now, the interesting thing is, Manicol is only about an hour's drive from Tipperary. And so I could be related to Barack somewhere down the line. So there we are. Interesting, isn't it? Um, ancestry. But for me, that was just, it was just an interesting thing to do. But for Paul, he was saying... I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. And not only was he pure Jew, he was a Pharisee. It says, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. And the Pharisees were considered the elite of the society. They were like the kind of gatekeepers. They were the people who others feared when they uh, were in the streets. They had authority. They considered themselves holier than other people, special people. And he says, I was, I was a Pharisee. Um, I was persecuting the church, ba righteousness based on the law, faultless. So not only was Paul a Pharisee, he was a super Pharisee. This is what he said in Galatians. He said, you've heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age, among my people, and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. And it's a bit like Paul was saying, look, you want to boast, I can boast. It's a bit like saying today, not only did I get into Oxford University, oh, I'm not talking about myself, but I didn't get into Oxford University, but not only did I get into Oxford University, but I got a first. And not only did I get a first, but I actually got the highest score in that subject that anybody's ever had. That's how smart I am. I am a Pharisee of Pharisees. I am a super Pharisee. So what Paul was saying is, if you want to say, if you want to boast, I can boast more. I am the greatest, is what Paul could have said. Remember Muhammad Ali? I am the greatest, he said. I am the greatest thing that ever lived. And Paul was saying, yeah, I could, I could say that. I could boast, but I'm not going to do that. And then he says something quite extraordinary. And this is what he discovered on Damascus Road. This is what began this sort of journey of self-discovery. His whole perspective changed. Whereas before, he would have been boasting. I could boast, but I'm not going to do it because I've come to Jesus and I've discovered something else. He says, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worthness, surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things and I consider them garbage. Whatever was 
gain to me, I consider loss. I don't think of any of those things that I valued before, any of those things that I thought were important, all the kind of things that people boast in, I'm not, I'm not bothered about them anymore. They're all lost to me. Compared with knowing Jesus. And he says, I have lost all things. And he, and he did. He lost his status in society. He could no longer be the great Jewish teacher that he was. Because they didn't want to listen to him. In fact, when he started talking about Jesus, they wanted to kill him. He lost in the eyes of the world all of his status, all of his privilege, but he said, but I don't care. Not bothered. Because knowing Jesus, knowing Jesus is much better. I consider them garbage. This is a really, really interesting word. We're going to think about this word for a few minutes. If you were to read the King James Version, it said, I consider all these things dung. Do people know what dung is? Yeah? Poo. Poo. That's right. The Greek word is skubalon. Skubalon. Okay? And it sounds a bit like Scooby-Doo, which rhymes. Okay? <laughs> so you can remember it. It, it can mean that. It basically means waste, things that are rotting. So it can be human waste, or it can be food waste. It covers uh, all of these things. Have you ever been to the fridge? And, I don't know, you've got out some cream cheese to put on your toast. And you, you haven't, um, you opened it a while ago, and when you open it up, ah! Oh! It's alive. There's creep. There's things growing on it. You ever done that? Yeah. Or you crack open an egg, and it's rotten. Or it's like festering fish. That's this word. Garbage. Done. Rottenness. I went to get a satsuma the other day. Pulled it out of the bowl, and my finger sunk into it. Mouldy. Horrible. And of course, you throw it in the bin, and then of course you have to wash all the others because that stuff, that gunk, is on them. You know, as the saying goes, one bad satsuma can spoil the whole bunch. No, something like that about fruit, okay? But this word, skubalon, festering fish, rotten eggs, mouldy satsuma, sour milk, disgustingness, horribleness putrid yuckiness. That, that's what the word means. It's a horrible, horrible word. And Paul said, all that stuff that I thought was important, all that stuff that people value, that's, that's how I see it now, compared with knowing Jesus. That's how radical the change in Paul's life was. You know, people want all kinds of things, don't they? Some people want status. They want to be important. They want people to look up to them. Uh, they might do that through politics. They might think, I'm going to become prime minister and people will look up to me. Doesn't always work, does it? Um, they might think, oh, I wish I was royalty and people would look up to me. Or they think, wow, money. I want to get lots of money. I can have lots of bling. I can have lots of stuff. And people will look at me and they will see me driving down the road in my Maserati. And they will think, there is a man that's made it. Or they want celebrity. They want people to, to know who they are when they go into a room or they walk down the street. They want fame and fortune, and if they don't have them, they could spend their lives dreaming about getting all of these things. I got an email last week, um, and it said, we can help you, Graham. It was a marketing email. And it's, 
Do you want to become the next YouTube influencer? And I could honestly say no. I'm not really interested in that. But, there's, but there was all these kind of ideas of how to become an influencer so that people would think you're important, you're influential. And those are the kind of things that Paul says are dumb, are rubbish, are putrid, are pointless compared with knowing Jesus. He's saying that you can have everything that this world values, you could rise to the top, but compared with Jesus, it's, it's worth nothing. You might as well flush it down the toilet or throw it in the bin. I consider them garbage, he says, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Jesus, faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Sometimes there are things in our lives which we really value, but which are wrong. Sometimes there are things which of themselves I'm not necessarily wrong, might, might be good things. But, it, but compared with Jesus, everything's rubbish. Paul realized that the stuff he had built his life upon was stopping him from seeing Jesus. So when these early Christians spoke about grace and forgiveness and mercy, he couldn't see it because it would mean that all that other stuff he was doing was worthless, was pointless, wasn't helping him at all. And, it, and to give up things that we think are really important is so hard. It took that revelation on the Damascus Road for Paul to be able to do that. When people are rich, and powerful and famous that can stop them from seeing their need for Jesus Jesus said didn't he uh, to a wealthy person how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom when people say I've got everything I need I don't see their need for Jesus it takes a revelation of the Spirit of God to turn people around. That's why this time now is potentially key for the church. I'm not bringing a prophetic word. I'm not claiming any insight on what is going to happen. But I'm just saying that this is potentially a turning point for the church. As people have suffered, as the foundations of their life have been shaken, as the things they built their lives upon that they thought were secure have been ripped away from them, as they spend their lives feeling insecure and anxious about what's going to happen, about their jobs, about COVID, they're no longer feeling that they are on solid ground. They're wobbly, they're like me riding a bike now. It's not very safe. They, they don't know what the future is and we need to pray for people to have a revelation of Jesus. Because once you've got Jesus, you don't need to worry about the other stuff that the world is seeking after because your life is built on a solid foundation on the rock. You don't need to be a billionaire because you have all the riches of Christ. So we need to pray for our world and we need to remind ourselves 
that when we gave our life to Jesus, he gave us all that we need. You cannot save yourself. You might try and make yourself good enough, but you will fail. As Christians, we can get into a kind of a mindset, well, I've started with Jesus now, and I've got to keep doing this, and I've got to keep doing that, but I really want God to really love me. God says it's all of grace. It's all of grace. If you feel like you're trying to cycle up that hill, Jesus has come alongside you. He's put his arm around you. He is bearing you along. So you don't need to fear. Trust him. Trust him with your life. Trust the gospel. I'll just finish on that great passage from Romans chapter 1. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it's written, the righteous will live by faith. It's by faith from first to last, literally from faith to faith. It's not about works. We put all that way behind us. It's about trusting Jesus entirely. Let's pray, shall we? Well, we thank you for the power of the gospel. The gospel transforms us. The gospel changes us. The gospel makes us realize that we can't get to heaven by our own efforts. Father, you are with us. You're alongside us. You're carrying us. Thank you, Lord, that it's not about us trying to do things, but it's about trusting what you've already done. We want to pray that we might remember that. We might live in grace. And Lord, we do pray for our society and for our world. Lord, we've been shaken. Things we trusted in, things that we thought were rock solid have been taken away. And Lord, there's so much anxiety, there's so much fear, so much uncertainty. We want to pray, Lord, for a revelation of Jesus to our society. Just as Paul had a revelation on that Damascus road, reveal yourself to our nation. Turn us into believers who are trusting you. And I'm fixed upon you. Amen.
week for communion.